computers in Seattle. <laughs> All right. But we don't have them. So this is the Seattle Blender User Group's HDR tutorial, which is uh, impromptu in the hallway because we haven't been let into the classroom yet. You're just in time for the HDR tutorial. Okay. As we wait to be let into the classroom. So, uh, HDR photography is something that uh, has uh, been very useful for 3D because you can use HDRs uh, as basically much denser, uh, light accurate images in your 3D scenes for image based lighting. So, if you imagine a ping, you think that's not a lossy format like a JPEG is. And you have all these pixels that are like RGB and they go from 0 to 1. And if you bring that into Blender or uh, something, it might look like a picture, but it's not actually representing the environment that uh, you took the photo in. Because light is not made out of black and white. It's made up of photons. And there's no such thing as white. So when a photon hits David's eye, and his eye is expanded really wide, it gives him sight blindness, and his head hurts a little bit um, because he's soaking it too much light. But that's not actually what the other. So when that, same, when that same thing hits Joey's eye, and Joey has his people shrunk down, uh, he lets in just a little bit, and the room is a different light spectrum. And so your eye is this complex machinery that's Love expanding that's open up. Shut up. HDR. <laughs> Shut up. So HDR photography is uh, when you're taking photos at different exposure levels and jamming them into like super files, which are called EXRs or HDRs. And then you can use that in a 3D scene to get image-based lighting. And uh, we've done mirror balls here, and I'm starting to graduate to the harder but more accurate uh, version of that, which is realistic 3D panoramas. So normally that camera would be over here. And let's talk about some setup, because that's one of the hardest things when you're getting into this, is you're basically taking photos, and you're spinning around and taking all these photos in this direction, and then you'd move this, and then you'd take more photos, and then eventually you'd stitch all these together, and there's sort of a disconnect between taking the photo here and then manipulating the photos over there. So I want to give you some basic ideas of how you can start to set it up so that you'll get accurate photos for your final product. Uh, so one of the first things you'll notice is I have this tripod, and I have this ridiculous contraption up here, which is a pano head. And uh, you're sort of going for two things uh, when you shoot these. One is that you don't want parallax. So if you imagine I hooked the camera up here, the lens would be out here. So as I rotate, we would get parallax because the lens is not depicting a single point in space. So what we want is to be hooking our camera up here so that the lens is here. So that as we rotate, it's a lot closer to the central point. And the same thing with why it's out here. So uh, I can rotate it up, and as I shoot the ground, it's still pointing from this approximate area. And if I rotate down here, it's still pointing in that single point. So then you don't have parallax. That's going to give you better stitches, and especially with stuff that's close to the foreground, it's going to be a lot more accurate. The next thing you're looking at is uh, how often is this turning? So if you get a really expensive, good panoramic head, it's going to have like uh, mechanisms that record like with little clicks how much you've rotated. So it'll go like click, and you can tell that you rotated exactly 15 degrees or 20 degrees. It'll click, 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 click. So it's a little easier to tell. And even fancier ones will have automatic motors. So uh, you won't even have to. Uh, have human error interfering at all, because when I go up here and rotate it, I'm moving the tripod a little bit. So a really fancy one has a motor on it that does the entire rotation, and therefore you have a lot less chance that your motions can mess it up. Uh, so the next thing that I do with this crappy version of the fancy Hollywood... Oh, is, your, is your camera going all the time while you're doing this? Is that yeah, it's recording. No, I'm talking about it. Or do you take stills, or how do you do the... Yeah, uh, uh, he takes a still at every... Uh, yeah, every 15, 15 degrees. Yeah, we'll get to 20 that. degrees. Right? Yeah, basically, so the next thing I do, this is my Remote. cheap, crappy version of this, is I just want to make sure that I have approximately the same degree of rotation every time I do this. So just get some junk, like coins or what have you. And so if you imagine these tripod legs as... 
uh, uh, three intersection. When you think this gets to drunk. So if you imagine these three tripod legs uh, dividing into our 360 degree shot, that means we're at uh, 120 degrees, 120 degrees, and 120 degrees. If you think you could uh, reasonably eyeball lining up your camera with the tripod leg. And then if you could reasonably eyeball lining up in the middle, then you have 60 degrees. So if you just start trying to have approximate bookmarks, like if you put it here, then you'd be able to go uh, 30 degrees uh, for, per shot if you're shooting at each leg, each coin, and in between each one. So if you then double that, 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 this, this, again, it's all for this is, yeah. So this is how, this is how you do the really, really cheap loser version of HDR photography. So now what do we have? We got tripod legs and all our markers. You want to make sure you don't step on them. So if you can reasonably aim your tripod at each of these, that means you have 9 divided into 360, which is 40 degrees. And then, if you can reasonably position it in between each of those markers, that means you're getting 20 degree angles per shot. So that's really good. The last things I would say for your tripod setup is the leg that you're doing, like pick a leg that you're doing first, and then Different people, when they're shooting HDR photography, have different markers that they prefer. I prefer using the sun as my marker. Some people say true north, uh, or, you know. But I, I think the sun is the easiest mnemonic. So I always start by pointing a tripod leg at the sun, which is where I'm going to start, and then building out from there. So that's the first thing I shoot. Would you put a compass rose right there and a, you little, can. a little marker? You can. And um, there's some other equipment that you start messing with here. So, if you imagine, you have to imagine the camera is on here. Uh, I, would, uh, I have a little level for the hot shoe of the camera, so it slides in right there. And then you can make sure that your tripod is level. Uh, I do one round where it's perfectly level, which equals um, you know, 18 shots this way. And then I do one at slightly above and slightly below. Uh, in theory, there's probably a perfect mathematical amount, but because I just want to make sure that I have things that I can stitch later, uh, what I aim for is making sure that I still have the horizon in either of these. So when I'm pointing at the floor, I want as much of the floor for the lower shot that still has the horizon in the very top of the, uh, the viewfinder. And same thing with here. It's mostly sky, but there's a little bit of horizon so that when I start stitching it to the middle row, it all makes sense. Can you uh, like paint over the top and bottom in Credo? Or? Yes. Okay. Um, and there's other, uh, there's other ways you can mask it in uh, Hugen so that, for instance, like if kids are running through and it totally ruins the shot, kids, uh, you, can, you can go into the photo that is wrong and mask that up. Um, a lot of people do that for like the tripod shadow also. The uh, other equipment you need is, uh, I would recommend a high speed SD card with at least eight gigs. Uh, because when you're shooting these brackets, you want as much of these shots to happen as close together as possible. Because if you take 15 minutes to shoot this, that means a car might have drive, driven into the scene, the sun might have started setting, people are running through, boats are going along the water, all these things that are in motion uh, are going to mess up why this one doesn't look like this one. So shooting really fast is good. So uh, you need to have a high speed SD card. This, uh, this one is a, a high speed card. I have one that is large enough but not high speed and it's really messing this process up because I'll start shooting and it's recording these you know, 50 megabyte raw files times three per shot. So it takes so long to record it to the card that I have to wait to start shooting the next angle. Um, so then, the next thing you do is uh, modify your camera settings. So what you want to do is be in manual mode. Uh, I wish we could look at it. 
Uh, I'll post a picture on my blog later of what settings I use. Uh, you want to be in manual mode. You want to have autofocus on. Just focus once and then turn autofocus off because you don't want it focusing per angle. And then uh, the, the stuff I use is if you're shooting outdoors, start with a shutter speed of 1 100th, an ISO of 100, and a lens angle or a, an aperture of uh, f16. And I mean, again, I'll write all these notes down on the internet later. Um, and that's a pretty good starting point for daylight. And then uh, you're going to modify your brackets. Um, the first thing you have to do to modify it for bracketing is set it to a two second timer or a, an amount of time. So um, when you do that, then you go to where it says exposure. And if you pull the little thing, this is on a Canon, uh, you'll have to check your own cameras for how to change this. Uh, you can then spread the exposure. And so that's basically the gist of it. Um, we would shoot it here, but we're recording video. But I can show you a lot of this stuff. Mm, got a camera in my car if you want to. Yeah, I got some stuff that I took for you guys. So now, that's the physical shooting thing. So I end up with 18 in the middle, 18 above, and 18 below. And now if you guys want to crowd around the laptop, we're not in the computer lab yet. You can start looking at some of the stuff that I shot. Yep. All right. So, assuming that you took some bracketed photos on your tripod and whatnot, you're then taking them over to your computer and you're opening up Luminance HDR. And then when you hit new image, on the, you get the HDR creation limiter, and you can select these three brackets of an HDR photo. You can see how there's, uh, it's a good starting place to check if there was any slight wiggle in your uh, tripod before you took these. And then the next thing you're going to do is you're going to turn on huge, uh, the auto align images. And if you did this, then it's going to create the HDR image. And it'll, it'll spin for a while and create this. And then you will have it pop up and you can save it at different sizes to different places. But it takes a while and we're not going to look at that. And you're not actually going to use this for uh, bracketed photos because we have 54 of these to do and they're very like slow files. So you're going to want to use the batch tool, which will do all of them over the course of an hour or so for you. So if you go to tools under batch the HDR, you can set the file that you want this to record as. Generally, you want EXRs, which are the sort of industry standards. You can then say auto align. And then you're just going to select uh, the file that your uh, camera raw files are in, or the folder your camera raw files are in, and an output folder. And you're also setting how many brackets you have. So if you took uh, three brackets or five brackets or whatnot, you might increase that. We t we're taking them at three brackets. And what this means is you have to ha have exactly a number of files in this folder divided by three um, because it's expecting three files for one, two, three, and then three more files for four, five, six. So you have to end up with a uh, divider multiple thing of yeah, multiple <clears throat> three. So if you did all that, you would now have this next folder, which is where we have the output, which is where I output all my EXRs. And now this is a file that is very fun to see in Blender. So again, I'm opening Blender, and I switch to the image editor to view the file. I can just drag it in, and it's going to go very slow. And now we get this file, and the image doesn't actually look uh, very perfect. But that's because we now have a very complex, hard to understand uh, file full of very interesting color data. And uh, I'm still not uh, totally well versed in this, but you're dealing with scene, revert, re scene referred color versus display referred color. And so scene referred is, for any given pixel, how accurate is it to what you wanted as the output versus how much of it was destroyed uh, in the creation. So uh, an HDR file that you're using for environment lighting is very different from a tone mapped HDR 
meaning that you stuck these files together just to make a pretty looking photo. And that's what normally people think of as HDR photography, is just photos that look really sharp and cool uh, because you bracketed it. But that is not the case. So let me ask you about that. So <coughs> the difference between the pretty photo that you wanted to print and this here, that decision point came in Luminance when you chose what sort of file to save it? Uh, to some extent, it was Luminance. To some extent, um, it's the program we used. So for instance, Photoshop has HDR support. Now what that means in their mind is they're bringing in three bracketed photos, turning them into one super photo. So on your underexposed photo, you can get these really sharp, crisp highlights in the clouds. Uh, and then you're throwing away your dark, muddy shadows of that underexposed one. And then on the high end, you can get these really crisp looking shadows everywhere. But then you throw away your blasted out cloud light. Um, and so that means the photo is the end product. But for 3D, what we want is uh, an environment map as the end product, wherein the file format stores the actual lighting information to some extent. And you can see this in Blender. When you click on this file now, uh, it's going to have very strange. Actually, I'm going to open. Oh, yeah, if you open it and switch to icons, Blender actually usually has an even better version of this. I'll try 19. I think that has the sun in it. Photos where you have the sun in it are really good to test because usually that is the hottest, the whitest part of a photo. So, how I, this is actually an old one. I think I made these out of JPEGs. I've been shooting one of these almost every day now. And when you're getting started, just prepare yourself. You're probably going to have to mess it up a few times before you make a good uh, HDR, um, especially considering how, how, how heavy these files are. So you're probably going to have to make 4 gigs to 8 gigs of uh, CR2 files and EXR files. And then um, if you want to do another one, which you do want to do more of, um, so that you can learn the process better, you end up throwing that away and starting over. Let me look at this one. Yeah, so this one was made out of CR2 files. And you can immediately see the difference, which is everything is super, super uh, totally blown out with white. If I open up my panel property, if you click on this, you can look at the RGB values down here, and to some extent the luminance, and you can see that you have represented in this file format a lot more information than uh, white equaling 1 and black equaling 0. You can also change the color space. And XYZ supposedly has uh, a lot more info. So you can see the RGB values are like 1.4, 4.5. And if I clicked on a picture of the sun, it might be something like uh, 80, 20, 40. Really crazy values. So that means you're doing something right if this EXR file uh, has very strange color values. Another thing you can do is use DC RAW. So DC RAW is another program that is out there and is uh, kind of a good standard for EXR because it's trying to make sure that uh, it's trying to be the best answer to what the heck is all that information in your dense camera RAW file. Because a lot of different programs interpret it differently. So if you download cam uh, DC RAW, it then is a command line program. So you can run something like, let's see. So I'm going into my CR2 file. Now I can list all the CR2 file, files. Now if I type in DC raw, it'll tell you all the command line stuff you can do. So V prints a verbose message about what you're doing. 
um, minus, uh, and it also lets you write a lot of things. So I can write uh, minus minus e for extract an embedded thumbnail image. I can write it to a 16-bit TIFF, and that'll have the info, and it will be a little more viewable. So you can do stuff like you see raw. Uh, minus v minus e, so I'm getting a verbose message. I'm writing all the JPEG thumbnails, and I'll just do a you know, multiply sign so it does it to all the files in the current directory. It's going to generate all these thumbnails, right? This is just another thing that you should consider diving into and playing with if you're uh, messing around with this. So now I have all these thumbnails of my uh, CR2 images, and I can see them a lot better. Uh, what I'm trying to say is that this is a very big subject, <laughs> and I can I have fairly bitten off a little bit. I'm trying to regurgitate this crop yeah, milk for you time guys. It will all come out. <sighs> so now let's say we did that batch on uh, luminance, and now we have this whole file full of EXR. Now we can run Hugin and try stitching these together. So Hugin. It's the next open source program that you're going to be using for this. Let me close my currently running one. All these programs are run on a different operating system. Yeah, uh, it should work on Windows and uh, Linux at the very least. Uh, I think it works on Mac. Program's called Hugin. Yeah, Hugin or Hugin or Hugin. H U G I N. H U G I N. Does Photoshop have a stitch feature? Uh, they have a new one. I'm still on like Photoshop CS5 or 3 or something, depending on your computer. Um, so, I always feel bad because I'm like, Max sucks. Uh, my opinion of it is based off of Max from 10 years ago. Now they probably do have the feature that I think Blender has and they don't. So let's open up Hugin or Hugin or Hugin. Uh, if you go to view, or if you go to interface, you can go simple advanced expert. We're gonna start with simple. Because in my experience, that's where I get the best results. We're not gonna stitch our EXRs today because since they're a lot heavier, it takes it's a lot slower. And so hopefully by Okay. So we're in the classroom now. Alright, we were out we got all their stuff set up. Uh first off I wanted to really quickly show everyone over here how I have my camera set up. I'm on manual mode, uh one one hundredth uh shutter speed, F sixteen, hundred ISO. Next, I am going to go down to uh, the speed. I'm going to change it from continuous shooting to self timer two seconds. You guys can't see this, but it'll be on the video later. Then I'm going to go up here, which is where the exposures are, and now I'm going to use the little wheel. I'm going to increase my exposures. So now, if I took a photo, it's going to not line up because I was holding it manually. But if it was on a tripod, it would take those three photos at different exposures each, uh, in three from the exact same angle, except for little tripod wiggles. And therefore, you'd have your final output. So now let's look at how we can stitch these together in Hugin. We talked about jamming them together in Luminance. And this is Hugin. I like to start with the simple interface. And I'm going to start by loading images. Here are some, uh, these are just previous ones that I had created. And again, we're using JPEGs because they are faster. So this uh, this was not when this was not a necessarily great 
rotation, but you should be able to get the gist of it. So here you can see my up above shots, and here are my down below shots. And I believe this is uh, one that I shot with, let's see, one, two, three, four, five. This was 12. So this was one I was shooting with uh, one coin between each tripod leg, and therefore shooting coins, tripod legs, and in between them for a total of 12. And it was giving me just slightly too little overlap. So that's why I switched to using two coins and going with 18 series. And holy crap, what's going on? It's trying to load these just in order without any control point. So now what we have to do is start stitching these. So Fusion has, if we go to advanced, it brings up the panorama stitcher. Here we can see all the photos. Again, these are just the JPEGs, and therefore they're going to go really fast. If I go to control points, you basically have two images that you're viewing at one time. Over here we have zero, uh, which is one, and you know, code language always starts with uh, zero. And this is the same photo over here. If I go to one, you can see how it's a neighboring file uh, that's slightly off. And you can already tell that uh, these photos did not have enough angle. It's at a glance. Uh, you can't really tell where they stitch together, right? Well, if you look very closely, there's this wall of uh, mosaic tiles that kids made, and here's the other side of it. So we're going to try starting with a little click over here. So if I click over here, one click instantly zooms me a lot closer, and I can start moving it over and over and over. And I'm going to find one that's high contrast. You're looking for contrast in lights versus dark and contrasts in color. And this little preview, uh, you can see how it'll smash it into uh, more contrast and different color. So this little eagle or whatever is a good example. And now if I just click over here, it'll probably do a pretty good job of auto finding it or mess it up. So what we often have to do now is look for it. Where is that eagle? It's right there. There it is. There we go. And then we go to the next one. So this was a bad example because it didn't have enough. Uh, it didn't have enough overlap, so it was hard to find something and eyeball it. And now we have this beautiful map of America, which is a little easier to find control points. So now, if I click here, I'm just going to get this little tip of. Let's just now let's go get the tip of Maine. Now if I click here, it should just auto-locate it. Yep, so I didn't have to do any work. It just automatically figured it out. And if it says there's an error, chances are you should just delete it and try again. And keep trying until the computer algorithm says uh, it made sense to it. Let's get the best state, Washington. Click over here. And see, it instantly found it. Oh, I was doing one thing wrong, so I gotta go back. Uh, I did not have auto add on, so when I clicked those two control points and it didn't see where they were, eagle, eagle. This is still one of the clunkier parts of the interface, but hey, it's free. Where is that eagle? So now, click right there. Yeah. So we got the eagle. So now uh, I'm going to manually add that one and it creates this control point. Now I turned auto add on, so for the next few it should just automatically work. So that tip of main. I'll just a little bit. And the tip of main. And I found it and added a point. We can just go through here real fast and add one more point. 
I like going for sharp angles. Uh, you know, stuff like windows are really good. Trees are your enemy. We should cut down all the trees if we lived in a panorama oriented society. Good move from your neck. Uh, let me see. There's this car that's above the stroller, and you can just see. Oops, like a tree. Yeah. See, like this is an example of one where I didn't have enough overlap, and you now it's causing me grief. I think I'm gonna get this little reflector on my daughter's stroller. Right there. I found it and added the point. Next up, maybe this red car. That looks good. Back tire. I'm just going to do this uh, first round of 12 on the horizon. And now we're getting some windows, right? Windows are open. See that? Nice high contrast point. Shut up. Oh, this, this seems problematic. Yeah, so what are we looking at? First off, I flipped it. That's not, that's not pleasant, but it's, uh, you know, it's just a computer, man. It's not as smart as humans. I think this tree is this tree. So this window is this window. Does that seem right? Sure. Yeah. Give it a shot. Yeah. So I was just smart enough to figure out that one was good when it finds the point. To figure out what? It can it figure out it's flipped now that you found the point? Usually it can. Once once you start uh, having it figured out, it it undumbs a little bit. I'm gonna go for this sign that's over here. I was practicing on this. This is another thing I would suggest if you're getting if you're getting into this for the first time, which is you should in fact uh, practice on some JPEGs. Don't dive right into the fancy EXRs. It'll cause you sadness. EXRs never come out. Excellent. Yeah. Let's see if I can find this car. Nope. So I'm going to delete that point. Let's see. This tree is that tree. So I'm going to bite the bullet and map to some trees. Trees are not as good to map to because the, if it's a windy day, they're going to be moving around a lot. Um, we're almost all the way around the 360. So if you were doing this with your three panoramas of 18 photos each, one in the middle, one above, one below, uh, so see we're all the way around. So what I would do is stitch all the ones in the middle, including going from this one all the way back to zero, so that 12 and one are stitched together. And what do we have? So why are some of them upside down? It's just, um, yeah, I think, uh, to some extent, it's uh, to some extent. I think it's luminance's fault. It outputs it that way. Yeah. You didn't like uh, turn your camera over and have like that. No. Um, I did not. And again, when I have this attached, I have it attached. You have the little grippy part if you're on the cannon facing down. So I would do it like this. Um, and I just drilled holes in this with the metal and stuff. Uh, so that I have some amount of flexibility. And so you would do first, so you would do 1 through 12 and then 12 stitched back to 1, or rather 0 through 11. Then you would do uh, 12 through 23. Then uh, 24 through 36. Yeah. And then uh, you would go back and stitch the top to the bottom. So you would end up having zero. Uh, you would have zero over here and uh, 12 over here eventually. 
And now you'd see, like, this is why it's good to keep the horizon and the shot on the high ones and the low ones. Because I have this little building now that I would be able to map over there. But so for now, we're just going to start with these ones. Uh, can you do more than one point here? Uh, yeah, but uh, what I found is you want to, like, you know, you don't want to waste too much of your time doing these points. Especially since once it has something to grab onto, it can actually start generating some of these points itself. Um, also, one thing that when you're doing this with EXRs, JPEGs record in their metadata the camera lens that you were using at the time. So when I loaded this, it knew 19 millimeters, uh, 1.53. Uh, chances are, if you have a lens, it's going to be like this one is an 18 millimeter through 135 millimeter. You can see it somewhere around there. And so you generally want to be zoomed way in. Like you don't want to be zoomed out. Or you don't want to see far away. You want as much stuff. And if you ever are in the mood to buy more expensive equipment for your camera, another thing you might shell out for is an 8 millimeter lens, which is going to have a wider field of view, and therefore you could take a lot less pictures. So I've seen uh, stuff on the internet where somebody shot with an 8 millimeter and got uh, the whole thing done in like six photos. So anyways, we have all those control points. Now we're going to hit align. And it should start running crazy things. We don't have everything aligned, but it'll hopefully figure out at least the ones that we did stitch. And we should be able to kind of see in real time as it's trying to find some control points. I think I can show you an example of uh, one of my first successes. I do, again, stress. Uh, consider doing this on uh, JPEGs first, just because uh, it's kind of like baking bread. You're going to have to do all this work, and you let it sit for six hours, and then you discover that at the end of six hours it was a pile of crap. And you can't uh, undo that time. So start with your practice threads. From? It looks like that could be on the left hand as well. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm, st I'm, uh, I'm recording here. We'll try and figure out streaming on the break, I think. So all of this is basically trying to get the high quality version of what I used to do with my crappy mirror ball. Uh, this is my blog, ogblog.net. This file is probably pretty good. If I save this, again, I plan to have all this, all these files on this computer so I can show it to you a lot easier. Siesta is. So now you can see Hugin starting to stick these together. It's even starting to find points that we didn't uh, map. And uh, if we go to the control points, you can start to see how we have never touched this file, but it's starting to generate images. In fact, let's go to 12 to 13. So again, we never looked at these two, but Hugin is figuring it out with a little bit of starting help from us. 
so you don't have to. You only have to do like the middle. Um, yeah. Um, circle. And yeah, and in theory, you might want to go through and uh, on any of those given points. After it's done doing all this processing, you can go into these individual points and modify them if perhaps they're wrong. So like you've, uh, you saw while I was putting these in, occasionally it would jump to the wrong choice and I would have to go and either delete that point and redo it or something. So there's still a good chance that it's making that kind of error. And, you know, uh, it can get surprisingly messed up if first off you do have parallax. So if you did have your camera here, and your lens is out here. That parallax does cause problems when you try and stitch it. And the other thing is like just the smallest, like, oh, I touched my tripod. That'll ruin it. Um, but the ending quality ends up being a lot higher. A couple other examples of problems you have are uh, sometimes it uh, might have trouble figuring out how these lines connect, but usually it's pretty good. What's going to be way worse is if you shoot uh, power lines and telephone lines because those are blowing in the wind so that makes it very hard for it to figure out how they might connect together see this is an example of where control points would have helped because now it's I think, having some some problems with where the sky is but I think it's done stitching so all this stuff that's wrong, we could go in and manually edit that. Uh, but let's just save it for now. So now you click output, and here you have varying ways that you can output this. So uh, you might want EXRs or low dynamic range. Uh, so if I click high dynamic range, it'll have this format. You usually want EXR. And you can see that this is a gigantic file. But let's hit OK. And then it'll ask you to save it. So you save it. And we'll start batch processing that. We'll come back to that. Uh, for now, here's an example of like one of my first tests. So this is one of the test ones I shot. And this one was, you know, when I was initially stitching them, I often had lots of problems. So another thing to do in addition to just shooting in JPEG to start with is maybe just do the center row. Don't worry about the upper version and the lower version. Uh, if you can get the center stitch, then you'll have a starting idea of where you want to go with the uh, higher up stitch. So this was, this was shooting with, uh, only one coin per tripod leg, so 12 different versions. Hey, there's me. This is my living room. Now you know where the little kid crap. He does have a kid. Just yeah, I'm not just buying baby toys for myself. And anymore. Anymore. <laughs> The instant your child hits Legos aren't going to kill them anymore age, everyone buys like a giant bin of Legos, right? That's what I'm doing. You can buy them on Craigslist. That's my goal. <laughs> just find somebody who's been collecting them for decades and just... I won't realize when I still miss them. Yeah. So... So let's get a basic scene set up. You test this with Cyclone.
basic diffused material on this one, a lossy. So now we're going to go into our world setting and say use node. And under color, we're going to add a texture, which is an environment texture. And this will let us open up the file that we're using. In our case, this is going to be one of these EXRs. So we want these ones that are pure white, right? Oops, that's the material. Our background. Yeah. And now you can see that it's pure white everywhere. That's because this EXR has so much data stored from that environment that normally like a lossy file where it's jamming that into a zero to one scale of light would lose. So now if we turn this down to like point zero zero one, number lock. Ew. Let's say mirror ball. So this is the mirror balls that I was making. And you can see how you get very realistic lighting very fast. And if you did this with an equivalent JPEG and you tried to do something where you changed the strength, you would see how the JPEG or ping or whatever is a lossy format. You'll s you would say strength lower and the shadows would get lower, but all of a sudden the sun gets lower entirely. Whereas here, as we increase the strength, the shadows understand what a shadow is supposed to be at a low exposure, and the sun understands what a sun is supposed to be at high exposure. Well, Oscar, I can show you there's Something a trick like that. you can do for uh, using lower values. You can add a math node. Huh? Uh, no, just uh, just drop it and then pr plug into the value, set it to power. Power. And now just adjust the second one, not the first one, the second one. You uh, just raise it. Higher is lower value, plus to zero. It should be so. It, yeah, there you go. Yeah, that's good. Gives you more time. So. You don't have to yeah. type in nonsense. Then. So that's the goal that we're trying to do, is we're trying to get this awesome file format with all this cool lighting info, but we don't want to see all these scratches from the mirror ball, and we don't want to see the, like, you can tell here that this is a low resolution file. It's a super dense, powerful file format, but it's only like 512 by 512. So in that sense, we're losing a lot of this beautiful environment lighting that we could have had. And that is basically, in a nutshell, what I'm trying to do with these EXRs. Yeah, uh, the low res is fine if you just are using it for lighting and don't want... Lighting. Yeah, and like, you know, a lot of times in Blender, that's all you need. Um, but like, yeah, you can see, I think at, hopefully at this point of the process, you can tell why when you go on the internet and you want to buy photography, it's usually very, very cheap. And if you want to buy an HDR map, it's $60 all of a sudden. Uh, because uh, there's a lot more love that you have to put into an EXR um, and a really fine quality environment map. Um, so that's enough on that. Let's take a break and when we come back, 